As an attendee, speaker, and volunteer for many years, Dan is no stranger to PyCon. So please welcome Dan Callahan. Good morning, Cleveland. Good morning, PyCon. I guess you saw a preview of the slide during Ernest's talk instead of the code of conduct. And that's cool. It's, it's completely unrelated. This is the IBM PC Junior. I'm going to be talking about platforms. And, and this is a platform that was released in 1984. And it was IBM's first offering for home consumers. It made headlines, just not the ones that IBM wanted. Time Magazine calls it the biggest flop, one of the biggest flops in the history of computing. And they weren't alone in that opinion. Commercially, perhaps objectively, this was a bad computer. It was a bad platform. But you know how your parents are about technology decisions? That was when my dad decided that he wanted to buy a computer. So he came home with a PC Junior during its short one year of, uh, of being available on the market. And when I became old enough to become interested in computers and interested in programming, that was what I had at, you know, at access in my living room. As a consequence, the first programming language I was exposed to was BASIC. PC Junior came with BASIC, had a PC Junior, that's what I was going to learn. And I didn't realize it at the time, but the choice of what my first programming language was going to be was made for me. I didn't get to think about what was the best language, what was the, the most welcoming community, what was my local community using and supporting. The platform I was using completely dictated the tool that I was going to learn. Fast forward a few years. This is me in high school. And you can see I had great posture and impeccable fashion sense. <laughs> I was also fortunate enough to have my own computer. And on that computer, I was able to experiment with sophisticated tools like Perl and PHP and Linux. But I still found myself programming BASIC. Because I went through high school in an era before smartphones. So when I was bored in class, there wasn't a whole lot I could do about it. Somehow we survived. And, and one of the ways we got through those long days was with a graphing calculator, the TI-82. Somehow we managed to wring something resembling fun out of this lifeless gray brick. And we did that because that calculator was programmable. You just had to use BASIC. And so at that point, I learned that it didn't matter that at home, when I was you know, exploring software for myself, that I had access to more sophisticated tools or a more powerful platform. When I went to school, if I wanted to build something I could actually share with my friends and I could actually interact with, I had to do that in BASIC, because that was the platform we had. We had the graphing calculators. Fast forward to this year. In January, I became a father. And thank you. Not the best pair programming session I've ever had, but <laughs> it was good in other ways. And I started looking at my son and wondering, what will computers look like for his generation? And not just, not just in you know, Western countries and you know, upper middle class households, but, but also around the world. What are people going to be writing software on? What are people going to be using? What's the platform going to look like? And then what tools are going to be native to that platform? What tools are going to make it easy to address that platform? Maybe it could be Python. My name is Dan Callahan. You can find me on Twitter as Callahad. Uh, I work for Mozilla. I've been there six years. I actually joined Mozilla during the PyCon 2012 sprint. So that's me during new, new employee orientation wearing my PyCon shirt, really proud to be there. Uh, it's, you can watch me awkwardly introduce myself on YouTube if you want. I work for Mozilla because I, I personally believe in the power of the web to, and the potential of the web to do good, to connect people, to educate people, to empower people, to transcend borders. The web is an amazing medium. And Mozilla is a nonprofit dedicated to advancing and safeguarding the web as a public resource. We predominantly do that by developing the Firefox family of web browsers. And we build Firefox so that when the other major browsers, which are, are developed by Apple, Microsoft, and Google, meet to determine the future of their browsers and the future of the web and the future of this platform, that we've earned our place in the room and can advocate for a balance between private interest and public interest online. In my time at Mozilla, 
I've learned that we are utterly reliant on Python. We couldn't build, develop, test, or release our software without it. Fortunately, Python is a great tool. But that's what it is, right? A tool. I feel like calling Python a tool, despite Python being such a powerful and such a versatile and such an empowering tool, is selling it short. Because Python is more than a tool. Python is a community that happens to have a programming language attached to it. And that community is what brought us all into this room today. That community is what, what lets somebody walk into Python and feel welcome. And we intentionally try to bring people into this community that don't look like us, that don't use software the way we do, that work in different fields than we do. And that's rare and valuable. So Python's a tool, but Python's also more than that. I attended my first PyCon 10 years ago, and I've been present or volunteered at or spoken at every PyCon since, until last year. Last year, when the call for, for proposals went out, I sat down and I, I reflected on, on what I might want to speak about at PyCon. And I came to the, the really sad realization that I didn't think I had anything left to say to this community. Because I realized that in my personal and my professional life, I had, had moved on to platforms where Python didn't have a great story, and Python wasn't as relevant to me. And that was tragic. I don't, I don't want to leave Python, but, but the tools and the, and the places I were, it, it didn't have the same story. and didn't have the same versatility. And people move on, and that's OK, but you know, maybe, maybe Python doesn't have to be everything to everyone, but damn it, for a while we were. There's a saying in the Python community that Python is the second best language for anything. And, and no, no, you're laughing. That's an amazing aspiration, because that aspiration says that we're not the most specialized tool, but we may be the most versatile. We may be the most universal. We're a tool that you can learn once and take with you if you're doing systems administration, or you're doing web development, or you're in education, or you're in data science. Python goes everywhere, and that's incredible. And that strength is, is something that I think is captured in this. But I don't think that's accurate, because for one, especially if you look at the the schedule for this conference this year, Python is the first best language in many domains, at least in the sciences and in education. And that's no small feat. That's, that's decades of work from people like you sitting in this room trying to bring Python to more environments, more ecosystems, more audiences, more people. Because what's programming about? Why are we programming if not to serve people, if not to solve human problems? I also don't think that that saying that idiom holds, because there are platforms where Python isn't the second best choice, and it's not even a reasonable choice. What do I mean? If you're working in a field where you can target traditional computing platforms, if you can target Windows, Mac OS, and Linux on a laptop or a server, Python is and remains and will be an amazing tool. We have excellent support for those platforms. But those aren't the only computers anymore. People are increasingly moving to iOS, Android devices, uh, just going straight to the web with things like Chrome OS. And more and more, this is becoming what people think of when they think of a computer. Or maybe they don't think of a computer, it's just the computer they happen to have. Because I'll leave my house without my laptop, but if I leave my house without my phone, I'm going to turn around and go get it. And so like the graphing calculator, this is the platform that I have with me. This is the platform that's ubiquitous. And in many cases, this is the platform that's more affordable. So for a lot of people, a computer is one of these devices, not a laptop, not a desktop, not a server. The UK's Office of Communications did a study in 2015, five years after the release of the iPad, which found a full third of children under the age of six owned their own tablet. I mean, they, they probably didn't earn the money and buy it, but they had a tablet of their own. And so you've got a whole generation of kids that are going up with that being their mental model for a computer. And when they become interested in programming, if they become interested in programming, or if they work in a field that we may not call it programming, but write software, um, I mean, just if you've seen what people can do with Excel, Excel spreadsheets without thinking they're programming, it's absolutely wild. So whatever this next generation, whatever even our generation, people who are switching from current platforms to these, uh, these other platforms want to learn programming, they're going to want to reach for a tool that makes it easy to target those devices. And so what if you need to target one of those devices? Or what if you need to target all of the devices? And I think the only tool that actually goes everywhere, the only tool that actually gets you to all the platforms is the web. 
so a couple years ago, somebody at LG woefully misunderstood an instruction to put windows on a fridge. <laughs> and I look at that and I see a bad idea, and, and maybe you see a bad idea, but hidden in that bad idea is a very good idea or a very, very interesting consequence of, of the web being a universal platform. Because that fridge has the web, you have the convenience of the entire internet right in your kitchen. And it's not some separate fridge web, it's the whole web. And it's not just LG, it's also Samsung. <laughs> good God, those are good. Fridges connected to the internet. How do you perform a software update on that? <laughs> We're going to have botnets that'll... Uh, so I don't, I don't know what computers we're going to use in the future. I don't know what, what platforms five years from now will seem commonplace. Maybe we'll all have smart fridges. Maybe we'll all be wearing some sort of VR goggles. But what I do know is whatever that platform is, it will have access to content on the web. And that's possible because the web is built on open standards. There's no single vendor that controls the web. And that adds a layer of bureaucracy to the web because we have to get Mozilla and Microsoft and Apple and Google to all agree on, on where the web is going. But that also gives the web a certain degree of resilience and adaptability that you can't find in other platforms. So as long as the web is, is competitive, as long as there's a competitive browser market, as long as we're work, working on standards and coming together at the W3C and the What Working Group, then, then we can actually ensure that the web will go everywhere. And we can predict that this will be the platform that's universal. And that kind of speaks, I think, to the elephant in the room in the Python community, which is that JavaScript is surging in popularity not because people have heard that it's a language designed nearly as well as Python, but it's surging in popularity because the web goes everywhere, and with the web comes JavaScript. And if your platform determines your tool, and you're targeting the web, and for a long time the web was just JavaScript, well, I don't know, maybe that's what you reach for, because that makes it easy to start. Everyone has a browser. Maybe we could put Python on the web. Maybe that could let us, yay, right? <laughs> Maybe that could let us have Python everywhere. Maybe that could let us do amazing things that we haven't thought of now. Maybe that could let us expand Python into these platforms and into these communities that we don't currently have representation for. And I don't mean taking Python on the web to supplant or replace JavaScript. I mean putting Python on the web to take the best of JavaScript and the best of Python and smush them together into something that, frankly, could be amazing. And you don't have to imagine too hard because you can look at something like the Jupyter Notebooks and realize that, wait a second, this is, in part, some of the best of the web and some of the best of Python. The notebooks are in your browser because your browser is a good software platform. And the JavaScript world has great libraries for doing things like interactivity and, and GUI design, and, and the web will adapt, and it'll work on your fridge, and it'll work on your phone, and it works on your game console and everywhere. But meanwhile, the Jupyter Notebook is used to interface with other languages, especially Python, because there are also things that Python's really good at that JavaScript isn't as good at yet. Data analysis, scientific computing. Uh, we're slowly working at bringing integers to JavaScript. There, there are proposals out there, but we still don't have them, which, which limits some of the things you can do. Um, you laugh, but I mean, the web is the universal platform, right? The web is a viable software platform. Have you ever used a web-based email client or Google Maps? I mean. I don't know, somehow they managed to get by despite JavaScript's, you know, what, what may appear to be flaws. Not having integers probably is a flaw. Uh, we'll fix that. The syntax might be weird, but we'll get there. Anyways, the cool thing about the Jupyter Notebook is that, that it lets you bring, bring these two worlds together. You get to use Python, you get to use your browser. The thing that's not as great is that that Python has to run somewhere. And it can run on your PC, but what if you don't have a PC? And well, then you can run it in the cloud. And if you go to the Jupyter website, you can, you can start and you know, try a notebook live, and it gets hosted by MyBinder, which is really wonderful. But what if you don't have access to a reliable network connection? Or what if you're just on an airplane or on a train or in the middle of the ocean somehow for some reason? Then this amazing interactive document turns into something that's, that's still you know, well presented and, and still logical, and you can read it, but it becomes static. But if we could bring Python to the web, then you could put Python, the Python kernel that the Jupyter Notebook needs right in your browser, and then wherever your, your notebook is, so is Python, and then it keeps running, and it's interactive, and it goes wherever the web goes. And the way we can do that is with WebAssembly. I heard someone say, yes. So, so, so people are familiar with this. This is new. WebAssembly's only been around for about a year. 
But what it is, is it's, uh, you, you may hear it referred to as WASM or WASM. Uh, it's a new format for programs on the web. It's low level, it's binary, and it serves as a complement to JavaScript because JavaScript's a very high level text-based language. And most software ecosystems give developers a choice between choosing a high level language because it's clear and expressive or choosing a low level language because you want more manual control or, or you want other benefits that low level languages provide. And we do this in Python all the time. Let me explain. The two reasons that you tend to reach for low-level language are portability or performance. In the case of performance, take a library like a, or a module like NumPy. NumPy is designed to deal with large, multi-dimensional arrays. And the majority of NumPy is written in C, because C is what allows NumPy to, to very efficiently and carefully handle how that data is represented in memory and how that data is manipulated in memory. But that C core is wrapped around a Python module that provides all the interface to it. So you import NumPy and you use it just like you would any other Python module. It doesn't matter and you're not aware of the fact that it's, it's implemented in something other than Python under the hood. It just happens to be really, really efficient and really, really fast. The other reason, aside from you know, clearing low-level performance, or clearing performance bottlenecks with a low-level language, the other reason to reach for a low-level language is for portability. So if you've ever used the, the SQLite module in Python, we didn't have to re-implement SQLite to bring it to Python. SQLite's written in C, and so we could just compile Python, or compile SQLite to a low-level language, to a binary that Python can then interoperate with. Because most pro programming languages make it very easy to call in between the high-level world and the low-level world. What WebAssembly does is it brings these same options and these same choices in that decision between when is the high-level language the right tool and when is the low-level language the right tool to the web. Let me show you what that looks like. This is a pre-recorded demo because it's a keynote, and I'm not going to try to type this live. <laughs> but this is a small, small Rust library that just calculates a Fibonacci number. I can compile that and get out on a Mac, uh, because I'm on Mac OS, a .dilib file. And that's kind of like a DLL or an SO if you're on Windows or, or Linux. It's a shared library. It's a compiled version of, of my code. And because Python makes it easy to call into a low-level language, I can write four lines of boilerplate and then I can call that exact function from Python, and it works. What WebAssembly lets me do, and, and what Rust especially, because Rust and C and C++ have, have good facilities for compiling to WebAssembly, is it lets me just change a compiler flag and say, target this at the web. And then what I get out is this .wasm file. And that's a binary, and it looks like utter mess if you accidentally open it in your text editor. But that's fine, because you feed it to the browser, four lines of boilerplate, and what you get out is that same function and the ability to call that same code in your browser. So if you have a language that can compile to the web, then you can run it in the web, and you can run it everywhere the web goes. And so I was able to take Rust, and I was able to, to write the core of, of my application, the core of this library in Rust, use it in Python. I was also able to compile it to WebAssembly and use it on the web. And that's kind of interesting, because if you have a compiler, then you can bring effectively arbitrarily complex code from one ecosystem into the other. At Google I.O. this week, there was an announcement that AutoCAD, a 35-year-old code base, I am not yet 35 years old. That code is older than I am, was able to, to run in the browser because the, the team working on it was able to compile it into WebAssembly. And then you can just follow a link, and there's no software store, there's no, no installation process, there's no, oh, what sort of platform are you on? You just follow a link, and you can have access to this you know, stalwart, venerable, I don't actually, I've never used computer-aided design. But I hear AutoCAD's a big deal, and now it's in your browser. And that means it can also be on your fridge. <laughs> so if you've been around the Python community, you've probably heard of, of Gary Bernhardt's talk from PyCon 2014, The Birth and Death of JavaScript. If you haven't watched the talk, you should go watch it. Uh, if you watch the talk during PyCon 2014 or shortly thereafter, you probably left the room thinking, wow, Gary's a great entertainer, and he's a good speaker. If you go back and watch that talk today, you start feeling a little uncomfortable because you realize that Gary kind of foresaw all of this. Because what Gary, Gary talked about in that, that presentation was imagining a world where the web has one, and the web is this universal platform, the web is programmable. And he hypothesized that one day, maybe we'll take something like the Windows version of the, the GIMP editing suite, 
and run that inside the Mac version of Chrome, which of course would be running inside the Mac version of Firefox. And everyone laughed because there's no way that could ever actually happen. <laughs> so I can't, I can't do that for you, but, but if, wait, 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 let me, uh, this, this will take a second to boot. So, so this is Windows, uh, Windows 3, and this is Netscape, which is... <laughs> Hello, Netscape. Uh, Netscape. Netscape is why we have Firefox today, because as part of, as part of Netscape losing the browser wars, uh, as part of their, their kind of last-ditch Hail Mary, as they said, well, all right, let's, instead of facing down Microsoft with 100 of us versus 1,000 of them, if we release the source code behind Netscape, maybe, maybe that could be the world against Microsoft. Maybe we could still have a competitive web. And that's what became Mozilla. That's what became Firefox. And so what's amazing is you can, you can look at this code. This was a version of Netscape from 1996. There are people in this room that are younger than this browser. And it still looks and feels like the web. The web is this universal platform. And it turns out this browser is currently running inside Firefox. Mm -hmm. Right there. And so to be true to Gary's, uh, Gary's memory, I could go and launch Paint, but it's, the version of Paint in Windows 3 is not good. Um, <laughs> but we can, we can start, treating the computer, or start treating the web like a computer, because WebAssembly gives us low-level capabilities. And I can give you a link to this, and you can run it in your own browser. And in fact, the Internet Archive is doing just this. The Internet Archive has a software library where you can go and run all these old DOS and Mac games and utilities and things like that right in your browser. But the web's also really capable, because what you can do is you can also take that same, same emulator. So what, what's happened is I've taken DOSBox, and I've compiled DOSBox to WebAssembly. Then on top of DOSBox in my browser, I'm running unmodified Windows 3 and then unmodified Netscape 3. Um, but you can also start mashing this up with other things the web can do. And a lot of us who, who have been around software for a while still think of the web in ways that, that were kind of ossified in the era of Netscape Navigator 3 and 4. And we think of it as a document platform. We think of it as, as being flat and text-based. But the web supports 3D and the web supports virtual reality, so you can also go and take this and paint it onto a, as a texture in a 3D environment. <laughs> and <laughs> And if you visit this on your phone, the, the web goes to your phone, so that also works. And you can actually use your accelerometer and hold your phone up and look around the room and pretend like you're programming in a basement in the 90s. <laughs> and credit where credit's due. This is a demo by uh, James Baikoyanu of, of Janus VR. And he posted this on Twitter uh, over a year ago. And it's still one of the coolest things I've ever seen done with WebAssembly. I don't think it gets enough, enough attention that, that you, can, you can really use your browser and you can really use the web as a computing platform. Can I do it anywhere? And the answer is yes. This is a screenshot I took last year when Edge and Safari, Edge and uh, Safari both on iOS and on Macs, turned WebAssembly on by default. WebAssembly is everywhere. WebAssembly is part of the web today. So can we just compile Python to the web and be done? I'm so, I'm so sorry. Somebody was like, yeah! <laughs> God. <laughs> not quite, not quite. Um, so WebAssembly is really basic. It, it effectively gives you a, a virtual CPU inside your browser. And all the CPU really understands is numbers and memory. And that's cool, because that's really all any CPU understands. And so you can, you can build up these abstractions on top of that. You can, you know, if you need a string, you can say, all right, well, it's going to be memory starting here going until the memory is zero or whatever else. We do that all the time. That's how computers work. Uh, but the other thing that's interesting about WebAssembly is that it's actually running inside your browser's JavaScript engine. And your browser is responsible for taking WebAssembly and converting it down very quickly and efficiently, but still converting it to native code for whatever actual CPU is inside your device. And because this is happening, and because this is happening inside kind of the JavaScript sandbox, that means that WebAssembly only has access to things that the web would have access to. And the web has access to a lot of things. We had, the, we had WebVR, we have WebGL. Um, but it does mean that, that WebAssembly apps can't read and write arbitrary files on your PC. It can't read random parts of memory. Uh, it's single-threaded. You can't open a raw network socket. So it's still just as safe as, as JavaScript. It's just 
you can now treat the web like a compilation target. OK, I lied. You can actually compile Python to the web. So, so this is PyPyJS. Um, a colleague of mine presented this at PyCon a few years back. Unfortunately, the project is now defunct. But, but what PyPyJS was, was he took PyPy, uh, individual Ryan Kelly, and he, he compiled that to a predecessor of WebAssembly called asm.js, asm.js. And the funny thing about PyPy is that PyPy is really good at certain types of tasks. And so if you run the PyStone benchmark, and you can go to pypyjs.org right now and do this in yourself in your browser, on my laptop in my browser, I benchmark at about 300,000 of these things a second. If I do that natively on my computer, of course, it's not faster. Um, PyPyJS in my browser is actually about twice as fast as real C Python on my laptop natively. And that's not a fair comparison, because it's two different Pythons, PyPy versus CPython. But it does still, still make the point that it is possible to bring all of Python to the web. And it's not horribly slow, and it's not horribly incompatible. The problem is it's also not very webby. PyPyJS is a, is a really amazing demo, but it's also this big six megabyte binary file, effectively, that you have to download and run. And, and that's not how the web works. Six megabytes is a really high price to pay if you're trying, or is a high price pay. It may make sense if you're trying to do something like a Jupyter Notebook where you want all of Python in your browser, but it's too large a cost to pay if you want something just like Python syntax for list comprehensions. And so we need to find some sort of way, if we're going to make, if we're going to agree, or if, if I'm going to convince you that the web is a valuable platform for Python to target, then we need to find ways to, to work alongside the web and use the web's native capabilities for what they're good at and use Python for what Python's good at. There's no sense re reinventing the web. We've got a good web. It's here. One of the consequences of the platform you're targeting dictating the tool that you use is that for many people, the web is the platform today. And for the majority of the web's existence, JavaScript has been the only language, the only tool available on that platform. And, and that's good in that we owe JavaScript for the viability of the web as a platform at all. JavaScript is the language that went everywhere. And there's really amazing work being done in JavaScript in terms of library design, in terms of, especially in terms of front-end engineering. And JavaScript may not have, have the same breadth as Python, but in time, if, if I'm right at predicting that the web is this universal platform, if, if the writing is on the wall that this is the one platform that goes everywhere, then in time, the web will take uh, take on those other tasks and those other responsibilities and those other capabilities that it doesn't have right now. But that also means that Python has a lot to offer to the web. In Python, we're the second best language for anything. We have a module for anything you could possibly want to do in Python. Scientific computing isn't very big in JavaScript, but it's a massive subfield of the Python community. And that's something we can bring to the web, and that's something we could contribute back. But more than that, I think, I think the Python the community ethos is something that every pro programming language could benefit from. Because when you're a part of the Python community, you're part of a community that cares about the human behind the keyboard, both personally and also in the software we write. We, we care about ergonomics. We care about clarity. We have the Zen of Python. And that's, that's important. Languages other than Python don't have that same, same kind of clarion call to say, we're writing this software and we're building these tools for humans. We're pragmatic. We write documentation. Python is powerful. Python has a lot to offer. And so what's new isn't that, isn't that Python's going to take over the web, and, and I'd argue that that'd actually be bad, because we all benefit by, I mean, just look at the Python community. We benefit by expanding the people that are here. We benefit by, by going to more places. But what's new is that the web is JavaScript and the possibility of other languages. And if we do this in a way that, that lets us leverage the best of both, then that elevates both Python and JavaScript, and that ensures that Python stays relevant no matter what platforms the future holds. The trick is figuring out how to do it. How do we bring real Python to, a web in, in the, way, to the web in a way that makes sense for the web? I don't know. We have, there's, there's some experiments, there's some prior, prior examples we can look at, but all I'm certain of is that we have the tools we need. We have the pieces we need. The potential is here. The potential is real. But it's uncharted territory, waiting to be explored. Maybe that's where you come in. Thank you so much. Welcome to PyCon. I'll see you on the web. <laughs>